I'm going to talk about Cardamax, which is a novel treatment for single, it's a single stage procedure, which is nice, a nice uh, aspect of the treatment. Go over some review of the cartilage science beside, beside, around cryopreservation of articular cartilage, and then some applications for the Cardamax pearls to optimize results. Go over my 24 month experience with this uh, implant, and then some rehabilitation guidelines at the end. So uh, if you think about, uh, uh, oh, these are my disclosures. And if you think about this, it has the benefits of viable chondrocytes uh, in an optimal uh, handling kind of configuration. It's putty-like, and that allows for you to mold it to any lesion, shape, or size. It has a 12-month shelf life, which allows you to have something off the shelf with viable chondrocytes, which is not available in the market. And it, it allows for a reasonable volume of fill of defect, defects up to five centimeters squared. You think about cryopreservation, this is what we really thought of for quite some time. And my wonderful mentor, Dr. Henry Mankin and William Tomford showed uh, numerous years ago that it was really tough to cryopreserve particular cartilage. So fresh controls, we know we can preserve those and we currently use those for osteochondral allografts right now. If we rapidly freeze articular cartilage, we found we killed the cartilage. And so that was our negative control in this study. And then they showed that it was slow freezing and with use of DMSO, they were able to freeze, but only the superficial region of the articular cartilage. And this is what we really thought was the case for, for numerous years. If you look at this group C and from the, from the paper in JOR in 1996, you see by fluorescent microscopy that only the superficial layer, which is these white area, the white area at the top here is really preserved. The deeper middle layer and, and uh, deep layers are not preserved at all. This uh, confocal microscopy shows this really well with the, to the left, all the avital cells, all those cells are dead. And on the right, we see the vital cells are only preserved in the very bright dots at the top, which is the superficial zone of the articular cartilage. So for numerous years, we felt this was really what we could, what we could really maximize in terms of prior preservation of articular cartilage cells. And then if they use DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, and added that to this freezing technique, this slow freezing technique, we really could get a better density of, of preservation of the superficial cells, as you see in that top zone, that superficial zone. But everything, once again, underneath it, the deep and middle zones was, was dead. And then using, once again, confocal microscopy, we can see we have a much thicker top zone on the right there, the vital cells is a thicker layer of cells that were preserved. But once again, the deeper layer is dead. So you really couldn't use that full thickness osteochondral allograft that's cryopreserved to implant into a defect and get that to really survive. You needed the entire layer to really be preserved as we do with fresh grafts today. And, and that's what we really stuck with for, for numerous years. So the innovations that we developed with this new technique are really, really uh, uh, amazing, really that we can use these off the shelf cells in, in a fiber formation, as you see on the left there, cryopreserved in a proprietary media that then is thawed out. And I'll show you how to prepare that in a minute mixed with the matrix. This is the lyophilized cartilage powder. This is glycosaminic glycan or agar cans that's mixed. And then it forms this nice little putty. As long as it stays dry, it forms a nice putty and you can implant it, that into the defect that you see at the time of, uh, of, of uh, arthroscopy. So if you look at cellular characterization, typically chondrocytes express CD44 and CD49E cell surface markers. With these viable cartilage fibers, we found that when we isolate these cryopreserved cells, they once again also express CD44 and 49E, but did not express CD45. So this is consistent with a, basically a homogeneous population of particular chondrocytes, which is what we want. We then further characterize these same cartilage fibers by fluorescent microscopy. We can see that the cells are viable. We then play them at day 14, day 21, as we see in the center, and then to the right, day 24, and we have a confluent petri dish of articular chondrocytes that have really proliferated well. When we took these same cells, grew them, and then check for h &E staining, collagen type 2 staining, as well as proteoglycan staining, we found that they really produced collagen type 2 and proteoglycans as we would expect viable articular chondrocytes to perform. So we have functional viable chondrocytes that are cryopreserved off the shelf that can really start to, to secrete those markers and those, those factors which are important for, for development of a normal articular cartilage repair. We then performed a GOAT model, and you can see to the left of the slide, the microfracture uh, that uh, model, where you see this uh, basically fibrous fill, 
a very inhomogeneous staining pattern for glycosaminic glycans. And to the right, we see a homogeneous staining pattern for glycosaminic glycans, which is more like normal articular cartilage, which can see to be adjacent edges of that lesion. It's also filled it up very nicely as opposed to the microfracture uh, arm of that uh, GOAT model study. When we looked at this for, uh, for uh, H&E and cows and type 2 staining, once again, we see what appears to be a normal homogeneous staining pattern for glycosaminic glycans and for collagen type 2, as opposed to the microfracture, which is very, very poor fill. So we see we have cartilage cells which appear to work uh, like we want them to, producing collagen type 2 as well as proteoglycans. We did a retention model in a cadaveric specimen, and this is what really was exciting. We didn't have to use any fiber and glue. We put the, put the uh, Cardamax into the, uh, a, a defect we created along the medial femoral condyle, closed the knee joint, and then did 500 cycles and demonstrated that we did not change the position of that graft at all. We then put it in the patella lesion and did 100 cycles, and once again, without fiber and glue, demonstrated no change in the, in the, in the construct, it really was able to stay in that defect without a significant problem. Once again, using no fiber and glue. So really uh, it eases the procedure. As long as it's dry, this will stay in place. At the time of, uh, of uh, implantation, you simply take this uh, vial, which is provided, uh, it, it's frozen, cryopreserved at minus 79 degrees Celsius. Take it out, let it thaw out at room temperature. Do not put it in hot water. Do not try to speed up the, th the thawing process. So start to thaw it as quick as you can so you don't have to sit there and wait too long. It takes, it takes, it takes about 10 minutes to thaw out. Uh, and then we take the top off and place this sterile straining top on, the, on top and we remove or decant that media. I then simply take three uh, saline washes at room, once again at room temperature and, and rinse those, those fibers and then gently remove all of the fluid from the area. You wanna really kind of make that really dry when you, when you get the fibers. They should look like you can see the, the bottom right there where you just see the fibers, no significant saline left in the, in the, in the vial. At 17 cases, which I follow closely of the knee, we did do some in the shoulder and elbow. So this is another application which can potentially be used, but we only followed the 17 cases in the knee initially. These were focal unipolar lesions. Uh, so not a kissing lesion situation, not an osteopathic process. You want well-contained borders. So this, this can be held in place. And obviously you want to uh, do it with a little mini arthrotomy, at least in my hands to make sure it's really dry. Normal alignment and ligament pathology should be addressed if needed, but you want to have a stable knee uh, with no kissing lesion. We looked at these patients for 24 months and used these outcomes measures, IKDC, Tegna, Lysome, Coos, and SF12 to look at these, uh, these patients. We also did some repeat MRIs at three and six months using MoCard scores. Where those results are coming out as we speak. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the cases. We have our lyophilized powder to the left. We've, we've decanted all the fluid. We then mix this with the uh, fibers and we, we create this putty. And you can see this patella lesion, which extends off the medial facet of the patella. It's really contoured quite nicely with this Cardamax implant. I did my first 13 patients and presented this in ICS single stage uh, presentations in Rome in 2019. And if you look at the first uh, 13 patients, the knee frequencies diminished significantly at six months from six preoperatively down to less than four postoperatively. And at 12 months, this trend continued in our one year update. And then we went to two years, it continued to trend nicely down these 17 patients that we followed closely uh, down to 24 months where it was really below one. So really limited pain in that population at 24 months. We looked at the IKDC and lysome scores. We see that the score significantly improved doubling. You really need that improvement of 10 to 12 points to be clinically meaning, meaningful. And we found that we were able to get 20 plus points improvement in these key functional measures at six months. And then once again, we saw the same trend developing at six months. They really plateaued out. Once we started to let these patients become active at six months, those results were maintained over that first one year. And then once again, we see there's no diminishment in results two years out. And we're seeing you know, significant 40 plus improvements in IKDC and lysome scores in that 17 patients that we looked at closely. In ICS Rome, we also used the CUS subscales to better characterize the results. And we see the pain symptom in ADL significantly improved at six months. We really didn't get a big jump in the sports and quality of life until about six months, because that's when we really let these patients start to get back to full activities. And you see here that we, uh, that we were able to get some really nice results at that six month time point. Once again, we looked at these at a one-year time point, and once again, 
look at the scores, we're really getting some significant improvements in ADL function and the sports quality of life continue to climb, racing sequentially up to approximately 90 at that point, two years out, we see these results are maintained in the sports and quality of life assessments. And certainly the ADL and symptom scores are significantly improved as well. MSF 12 and PSF 12 scores are uh, basically scores of, of quality of life. And we really saw, you know, uh, diminishment as we'd expect. Uh, and then we see these kind of plateau off, but not a big change in these scores in my, in my hands. We see the kind of plateau off as we get to that, that 18 month to 24 month time point. So here's a, a representative case, MPFL reconstruction in conjunction with Carlos implant. We see a very irregular irritated structure along the bone. And that you can see the bone is really irritated to the left of the slide. Here I am at implantation. So a pretty, pretty uh, big lesion. Uh, and we, we placed our, our, our uh, Cardimax into position. This is a three month MRI of that patient. We can see that the implant is still sitting in position, well filled, did not delaminate. Appropriate location we see here. And on axial image, we see it sitting in the right location in that, in that lesion. We look at our, our x-rays at six months. We have a well-positioned uh, uh, right knee uh, that is the operative knee. And there's well-maintained joint space by Merchant's view. And this is a neat video because this was my first patient. I didn't really fully know what to tell him to do or not to do. And he kind of went on his own and started doing open chain about two months out. So that's the patient for the MRI we just showed you. And this is the lesion with the concomitant MPFL. He jumped down and started walking around. And you can see he obviously has been doing some pretty good activities for quite some time because his quad structure was not that significant to diminish three months out. And I don't really, re I don't really recommend being this aggressive, but it was interesting when, when he really was fairly non-compliant that he was able to get going pretty quickly and was walking very nicely. And what that allows patients to do is get going at an earlier stage hopefully getting back to sports activities at an earlier stage post-operatively. Here's another representative case, a 21 year old female. She had eight plus year history of chronic dislocations, seven episodes. Her final episode was four weeks prior to seeing me, required an emergency room reduction. So pretty painful situation. You can see she has a hypoplastic trochlear groove and patella alta. Uh, she also had a high tibia tubercle trochlear groove distance. And you see here, uh, at MRI preoperatively, there's a kissing lesion on the lateral femoral condyle with a defect along the patella. At arthroscopy, as it typically does, it doesn't look as bad. And then you open it up and you say, oh my gosh, there's the lesion centrally located along the central eminence of the patella and extending to the medial facet. So I decided to proceed with a tibial tubercle uh, plasty to correct that patella alta as well as the, uh, the uh, instability and perform a concomitant MPFL reconstruction. One key aspect of the implantation is to make sure, you, as with any cartilage procedure, you remove down to normal vertical borders up to healthy articular cartilage edges, and you try to limit any breakage of the subcondral bone plate. This is not a microfracture technique. We don't want blood. We don't want fluid in that defect site. We want to carefully remove that, that uh, damaged calcified cartilage and fibrillated cartilage back to normal vertical borders, leaving a nice, nice controlled lesion to fill in, in the defect. So we did our, our tubercle plasty and we, we uh, controlled it. We concomitant MPFL, as you see right here at the bottom right, along with our, with our focus and osteotomy and fixated that area. See a large lesion has been filled. This patient got stiff postoperatively, so it allowed me to do a second look arthroscopy. And I was amazed at what I was able to see in terms of that fill of that lesion site. It really looks like it's healing in quite well. Uh, preliminary tissue as we would expect at 2.5 months after surgery. And this is the, that second look arthroscopy. You can see this is the edge of the lesion in this area right here. We have the fill of the defect right here, uh, and it's, it's filled in quite nicely. It's starting to incorporate well into the surrounding articular cartilage. So here's that same patient uh, at approximately six months after surgery. She's doing a nice open chain uh, extension exercise here. No crepitus, no grind noted on examination, no swelling in the knee. Quad function is starting to return quite nicely. I had her go ahead and do a squat too, since I got excited. And you can see she's functioning very well. And this patient did excellent uh, after surgery. 
So typical rehabilitation guidelines for femoral tibial lesions, we keep them in an immobilizer locked out for four weeks straight with ambulation, non-weight bearing to toe touch weight bearing for four weeks. And then we start progressing up 25 to 50% at four to five weeks, advancing to full weight bearing at five to six weeks. If you have an unloaded brace you can get for the patient, not a bad idea to go ahead and, and use that. Uh, typically we haven't performed a concomitant osteotomy in these patients. It's not a kissing nature to these lesions, but we wean out of that immobilizer into the, wean, wean out of the immobilizer into the unloaded brace at four to six weeks uh, and transitioning back to full weight bearing is tolerated. For teleformal lesions, we wanna limit the motion more so in these patients. And so we immobilize for six weeks straight with ambulation, toe test to 25% weight bearing for two weeks. But we can put weight on it more quickly with a locked out and immobilizer, locked out and extension. So we start 25 to 50% at two weeks, advancing up uh, after four to six weeks to full weight bearing with that immobilizer locked out straight once again. Typically what I've done is leave these patients locked in extension for five days with the hinged immobilizer. And then I start that gentle range of motion program, uh, you know, limiting aggressive flexion, particularly in the patellofemoral joint, but 45 degrees, one to two weeks, 60 degrees, three to four weeks, we start to get to 90 degrees. And then we start full flexion after four to six weeks. If you look at these lesions, you know, really ephemeral tibial lesions, we can start immediate isometric quadriceps contractions, ankle pumps, heel slides are allowed pretty much immediately uh, after we start that motion at five days out. Uh, and the core program can really be started pretty quickly at four to six weeks in that population. Uh, extra cycle, I usually waited to about six weeks, so don't wanna to be too aggressive. Six to eight weeks for elliptical training, aquatic program, alter G type activities can be performed at that point as well. A straight line running is allowed typically at 12 weeks in my practice. And, and then once they can do a single leg balance, we can then advance to, to full uh, sprinting and really aggressive running. So we wanna be able to balance on that leg, really uh, correcting that, that step down test to a negative step down test at 30 degrees flexion in the involved leg. For patellofemoral lesions, we wanna you know, limit any open chain activities for the first three months. We start a limited open chain program, typically at three months, advancing to full open chain at four months. And then a core program working on, you know, establishing better patellofemoral tracking is usually recommended at a four month time point. And in both groups, we're trying to transition after we can balance on that leg by itself at 30 degrees flexion, back to sports specific training, really looking at those milestones we could use uh, to avoid any further damage to the knee, meniscus tears or ACL tears from a valgus load at that point. So what we have in, in summary is, is basically cartilage, viable cartilage fibers that we can take off the shelf can be cryopreserved out to 12 months, uh, which is really an excellent feature. These cryopreserved fibers, uh, once thawed out and mixed with, with, the, with the agricans, the glyphalized powder creates a putty-like uh, implant that really can mold to any type of deformity that you have and fill that defect up nicely. Up to five centimeters squared, so reasonable size lesions uh, can be treated with this. And we saw the cells actually really act like chondrocytes producing a glycosamine glycan we want to see, releasing those collagen, uh, in recent, producing that collagen type two and those glycosamine glycans creating, creating a basically a homogeneous collagen matrix for these cells to live in. This is a football player that I did an MPFL on it and also the, uh, the Cardamax procedure simultaneously. And he was able to play football at a very high level at six months post-operatively. That same patient then really an excellent athlete, state champion shot put the next year. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's gonna go D1 somewhere. He's a great player and really did well. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Usually between 1.5 to five centimeters square lesions is what we're, we're treating with Cardamax. Smaller than that, uh, you know, I don't know that you really wanna, really anything in my hands for a one centimeter square lesion is gonna work. Um, even just observing it has been shown to be pretty effective in the literature. So I would say probably not warranted for less than 1.5 centimeters squared. Um, so we're doing 1.5 to 5 centimeters squared lesions typically. So you can get cute, but you've still got to evert the patella. So my incision is usually about a 5 centimeter, 4 to 5 centimeter length incision. I will then do a modified subvast approach and evert the patella and then concomitantly expose that ductor region, the sulcus, to place the graft using an allograft typically. I'll close the synovial layer, place my graft on top of the synovial layer. After I put my implant in place, close my synovial layer and then fix the patella 
region. So I fixate on the ductal region first and then extend it up to the superior medial patella secondarily after closing the synovial layer of my subvast exposure. One of my partners did one Carnamax in the medial femoral condyle. The fellow was, was kind of debriding the lesion. I came in to help him out at the beginning of their experience with Cardamax, and they got a little aggressive, got a little blood in there. When the blood was in there, it became a little particulate, and we did use fibrin glue in that case. The outcomes on that patient were outstanding, but that's when you need to consider using fibrin glue. So when there's any fluid around blood, it's going to make this turn into more of a particulate kind of appearance or, or feel. That's when I think you need to use the fibrin glue. You know, they've all been those medial patella facets and central eminence patella lesions that have extended off the edge. So those are the uncontained lesions that I've treated with Cardamax. Any femoral condyle or trochlear lesions I've treated with Cardamax have been well-contained. And so typically a well-contained lesion is what we're trying to treat with Cardamax. I think the future of Cardamax, once we can get this to be more readily available to the surgeons, would be other defects. Uh, one of my partners did it in the elbow. I did one in the shoulder. So those are areas where we typically are resistant to using cartilage grafting procedures, even osteochondral allografts. So for example, that capitella lesion, that's something that we consider doing cardamax in. So other sites is where I think this is going to go. Yes, I think it could be combined with an ACL, but yeah, the blood flow in that area would be something that I would be a little concerned about. I think it could be pulled off. I think you'd have to really do the ACL, drill the tunnels, pass the graft, don't fixate distally, and then make a mini arthrotomy and go ahead and dry that area out to do it concomitantly. I did do that in one patient. The guy's done very well, and that's exactly how I did it. So it can be done with an ACL, and I have a patient that I did that with.